Hello and welcome back to our construction uh, technology series. Today we're talking with Nate Allen, who's a professor at Brigham Young University, Idaho. How are you doing, Nate? Hi there, I'm doing good. Good. <laughs> so we're talking with Nate today about his career, how he's seen um, BIM implemented in, in architecture over time, and then specifically talking about the virtual design and construction program at, at Brigham Young University, Idaho. So Nate, why don't you begin by telling us a little bit about yourself, you know, your background. So I've been teaching at BYU-Idaho for the past eight years. And I've seen a lot of changes with VDC while I've been there. Mm -hmm. And a lot of changes, um, you know, since I left architecture, which is my background. I started out before teaching as an architect. Um, I was working, I started in Boise, Idaho. I came and I moved over here, worked for a small firm in Rexburg. Before I, I hired on with FFKR, a Salt Lake City firm who was doing a lot of big work, big projects right here in my town, and they needed some on-site help. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, I hired on with them. I worked on some big projects at the university. When I finished, I got hired by the university to be one of their architects. It, okay. it was just kind of a, you know, during the economic downturn, it was either go back to Salt Lake City or stay here with a more secure job. And at the time, architects were being laid off left and right. And I didn't like the prospects of selling my home and purchasing somewhere where, with less job security. So right. I took a job here and I liked it okay. I started looking at, um, you know, I think I wanna go back into the industry. And about that time, a teaching job, a teaching position opened up and I, I thought, oh, I'm not gonna stay here as a campus architect forever. I'm either going into the industry or maybe I'll just see what happens. And so mm -hmm. I applied for a teaching job and they hired me. Uh, so I'm kind of here uh, unexpectedly and maybe not by uh, a path that I had really carved out for myself. Um, it's, it's allowed me, I think, to, to kind of explore things that I didn't think I would get into. Um, mm -hmm. I probably would have been very focused on just architecture. But in teaching, we started seeing so many changes with technology and in particular VDC for construction managers. And our program has always been really good at giving construction managers a good dose of the architectural side of things. You know, we've, we've got three architects. That might be more than what a lot of construction management programs have. Right. And, and it seemed like we were already doing VDC. I mean, that's what we could offer to our students is, is kind of the, the 3D element and with a heavy dose of design and maybe more even than most VDC or construction managers are, are used to, right. but it was our vehicle. It was our method. It was our platform for giving them VDC it was is to incorporate design. Um, and it just kind of evolved until finally our department chair said, we ought to just turn this into a VDC program. And it made all of our, the architects in our program kind of feel like we're at home again. Right. <laughs> We're no longer just at, um, you know, a branch or under the umbrella of construction management. It feels more like we're doing what we're supposed to now. And it just happens to fit really well within construction management. So for us, it was a move that kind of benefited everybody. Yeah. And it's allowed me, I think, to be more aware than I would have been of some of the technology that benefits both architects and construction managers, because in order to teach it, I've, I've had to just kind of dive in, learn it for myself and figure some of it out. So yeah, there's a pretty, pretty thorough overview. Okay, good. good job. Yeah, well, what kind of, so just a follow up question, I mean, what kind of technology, you, you know, you mentioned that you've been forced to, to learn new technologies, work with new technologies, what, what are those technologies that, that you're, you've developed as a professor that you weren't necessarily using as an architect? Okay, so the main ones for me have to do with drones, uh, laser scanning, yeah. virtual reality, which honestly, I could have picked that up anywhere. That's, that's kind of uh, just, a, you pick the right software and that's right. all it's done for me. It gets a lot deeper 
you want to do some of the programming and Unreal Engine, and I haven't even touched that stuff. So uh, could go further than I have gone. Um, and I guess 3D printing, which a lot of architects do. I probably would have picked that one up too. But, but you also have probably similar to construction. You have architects that focus on that and architects that don't. So a lot of times an architect is aware of these technologies, but when they're ready to use it, they just kind of hand it over to somebody else. So I've had to be sort of at the center of all of it and trying to learn it for myself. And um, so, yeah, I've learned how to do laser scanning and, uh, you know, scan actual buildings, create the point clouds, process them. Um, with drones, we'll do scans using like drone deploy so that we can get a topography and then we'll mm -hmm. create it inside of Revit. Almost like doing a survey, <clears throat> pardon me. Oh, you're fine. Almost like doing a survey, <laughs> but obviously not nearly as accurate. So it, right. it, it works for preliminary stuff. It works for creating ideas. It wouldn't work for maybe creating uh, an accurate cut and fill plan or something like well, that. Well, it might, it might be really useful for, <clears throat> I mean, we're seeing a lot of these generative design tools nowadays that kind of a, a yeah. big, you know, a big use that architects have seen in generative design is, is mass layout on a site. So I think a drone deploy and getting kind of a basic topography would help inform, you know, an architect if they were using a generative design tool to kind of, um, you know, create lots of masking options, you know, um, maximize the site. So I think, well, I'm amazed at how accurate these scans really are. And okay. so even though I wouldn't trust them uh, the way that you would a professionally done survey, mm -hmm. for me as the architect, they really give me everything that I need. You know, if you're a contractor and you need to start putting in GPS points, maybe you can't use my stuff, but uh, to come up with a preliminary design, they are uh, more than adequate. And so, yeah, they're, they're pretty fascinating actually. Yeah, I've never worked with that tool, um, but I, I, I find it interesting that you mentioned, you know, because in my professional life, typically, typically what we see is the architect would come to the to the contractor to ask for a lot of those kinds of services, like the point cloud scanning, creating an as built model, or you know, kind of kind of using some of those technologies. <clears throat> so I think more and more architects are leaning on construction managers for for technology implementation. And, and maybe that's because construction firms, large construction firms have more of an impetus to invest in the adoption of the technology. I, I mean, when, when I was at Swinerton, we started getting into the, the point cloud technology because we wanted to measure something very basic, which was floor flattness, right? Because we were doing a lot of tenant improvements in existing office buildings, which involved, you know, basically taking out all of the office elements that were existing and then putting in new new cubicles, new furniture, uh, new assemblies. And a lot of times we'd run into trouble because the floor was, was not flat or level at all. And so, you know, we, we, we'd have a plan, we'd go in and we were constantly having to redo things. So initially, uh, Swinerton, the company I was working at, we invested in the point cloud. Um, uh, we were using a Ferro scanner. We invested in that just to measure floor flatness. But then it just took off from there. Once we made the initial investment, we started picking up work just to go scan buildings for architects. You know, architects were reaching out to us, like, can you scan this building for us? Um, and, you know, I know that that's a, a big service that a lot of people, like the company I work for now, Keller Pacific, they're, they're offering that to architects, contractors, so. I, I, think it, I think it's billable hours. I think it yeah. always boils down to billable hours. And, and contractors, it seems, uh, you know, I, I can't speak for them, but it seems like they have a little bit more flexibility and maybe a little um, extra under their profit margin mm -hmm. where they can say it's worth it for us to just kind of allocate some of these dollars to picking up these new skills and architects. And if they can't pencil it in and if they can't charge the client, they really just kind of shy away from it. And so to have the skill on hand means I got to hire somebody who does this and I've got to somehow keep providing uh, you know, a revenue source through this individual. And I don't think it's that realistic. Sometimes they'll need them, sometimes they won't. So contractors seem to be less scared of uh, some of the uh, assigning those dollars to the individuals. 
Yeah, well, and, and maybe that's where the value in, in picking these things up in, in your education, you know, in your college education comes yeah. in because if an architecture firm is, is looking at your resume, you know, they might see that you have all of these tech, technology, tech, you know, you can use all these technological tools and they'll hire you just because they don't want to make that investment themselves. And you could come in and already, you can add value, you can teach those around you how to use the technology. Um, so I think, I think it's really valuable. I mean, I haven't heard of a lot of VDNC programs in the country um, for construction management students. Um, you know, when I went to school at, at BYU Idaho, it was just kind of something I did. But most of the things I picked up was just in my own time. You know, I had that class, you know, you taught the, the introduction to BIM class. Mm -hmm. You know, we learned Revit, we built the house. Um, but a lot of the things I learned, it was just kind of, I bought more books, started getting into myself. Um, well, there's no better way. Yeah, right. <laughs> I can tell you that. All we can do is open a door for students. And there are those like you that blow us away with what they know by the time they leave. And there are others who don't know enough. Um, they don't even know what we've been trying to give them. You know, they, so the, the individual, the student has a lot to do with that. But I think we are trying more and more to introduce students to various amounts of technology. And we may be the first VDC program out there. I actually don't know of any other yeah, VDC program, but it's the term is moving so quickly and it's such a big buzzword that it's kind of inevitable. At this point, I already feel like there's got to be more out there. We just don't know about them. But when we created it, we honestly felt like we're the first ones doing this. We don't know of anyone else who offers a VDC degree. And so, uh, yeah, what, how do you even define what it is? Yeah. It's all brand new. Yeah, it is really hard to define. And, you know, every day I find something new that's out there, you know, looking, looking at the news, <clears throat> looking through news articles and blogs. And there's always some, <clears throat> either there's a new software, or there's a new way to use it. Um, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the tools like Revit or Dynamo or this new generative design platform, um, it's just like a sandbox piece of software. And you can basically make with it what you will. And so it's really up to the individual's ingenuity and passion, kind of like what you mentioned, the time that they put into it themselves that um, creates these new innovations. So, and I think it's important to note that, <clears throat> I think it's, I think it's going to be important for industry professionals to lead the way in, in some of these technology innovations. I think for the past three to four years, what I've seen um, as I've talked with you know, some of these software developers is that they've got these really intelligent software engineers, software developers who are working on products for the AEC industry, but they're not architects, engineers, or contractors. So they don't necessarily know exactly what uh, the industry is looking for. You know, they, they obviously talk with industry professionals and leaders and get their feedback. Um, but, but I've seen the most value in just people out in the industry using the software and using the tools and coming up with their own innovations. I think that that's, <clears throat> I think that those are the people that are gonna lead, lead the way in, in this technology innovation in, in architecture, engineering, construction, so. Well, I hope so. And I think that's what makes it such an exciting career. Yeah. You know, the inability to put your finger on it, but to know that um, I can be creative I can figure things out. Um, I can do things that nobody's really even thought of before. I mean, th those are all opportunities that appeal to a lot of our students. And even for a lot of professionals, I can continue having fun with this because I keep learning something new. I keep growing, I keep discovering. Uh, that's what makes a job fun. So let's, let's shift the focus a little bit because I, I want to talk about something that's interesting. Um, you know, when I, and this kind of goes back to a point you brought up early on, you know, because BYU Idaho has so many architects in the faculty, the construction management students are exposed to architectural, the, the architectural paradigm, you know, is what I'll call it, so, you know, the architect's point of view. When I graduated and went out into the construction management industry, there's always a lot of tension between contractors and architects. And there's a lot of misunderstandings between the two parties that arise just because Maybe they don't understand the, the, the perspective or point of view of the other party. Um, so a, a question that I, I might have for you is how, how do you help 
construction management students see things from an architectural standpoint? And how do you think that that's going to help them in their career working with architects? I think a lot of it has to do with personality and the mentality that you own. And that's the part that I can't give you, you know, as a student, like, um, and, and, I, and it's something that even if I do give to you, you, it's, you can't rely on everybody around you really having that mentality. And so I think we're trying to teach leadership one, that's a huge part of it. Um, but two, it's, it's all about exposure. I mean, I've always felt this way and I've taught this heavily in a lot of my classes. If you can just get inside the mind of an architect mm -hmm. and understand their, const their constraints and what they're going through, you're going to be a lot more reasonable when you work with them and vice versa. I mean, it just absolutely goes both ways. Somebody's putting pressure on me as an architect and this is why I'm doing the things that I'm doing. And somebody's putting pressure on you and that's why you're doing what you're doing. But I do teach in construction documents more than just how to read construction documents. For me, it's always been also about how did these things ever come to be? Right. What are all the factors that led these documents to where they are? There are code constraints, there are zoning constraints, there's program and budget, um, you know, working with a client um there's there's just so many deadlines and other factors that have shaped the building into what it is and and uh and i feel like hey if you go through that process even just a couple times well that's a big eye opener and you start to see okay this this i don't like this about the project that i'm working on but now i have a better glimpse and understanding of why somebody would have ever made that decision in the first place yeah. And that really leads to now we have more people coming up with solutions. If this is a challenge, if this is a problem and I'm a contractor, I might see a solution through a different lens. And, uh, you know, the architect is, is always going to approach it from one perspective and we can open each other's eyes. So it, it yeah, for me, it's really just um, get in someone else's shoes mm -hmm. and try to adopt that mentality of let's work together, let's be a team. And I think that's happening in the industry. I really do. I think it's going more that way. Um, but it does absolutely start with an individual who's been yeah. trained to think that way. And leadership, people who are willing to lead out and show others how it works. Yeah, I mean, gosh, you know, I, I, I knew a lot of contractors that would scoff at <clears throat> you know, the, the construction documents, when, when they'd find a tiny mistake or error um, on the plans, you know, I, you know, you, you, you'd hear a number of things, but when you, when you do it, like what you said, and you put yourself in the other person's shoes, like the architect was under these, these schedule constraints, the budget constraints, you know, just trying to get the, the, maybe trying to get the permit set out on time, you know, missing a couple things here or there is, is understandable. And then, <clears throat> You know, the, the other thing that I, that I see often is, is the, um, you know, a lot of times contractors will complain about the RFI response from the design team, you know, how it's taking such a long time to get, to get RFIs answered, get RFIs back. Um, but, <clears throat> you know, I think a lot of that is just the architect is, is trying to get to the finish line and maybe they don't have you know, the same amount of resources on, on the, the construction management side that they did on the design in the design phase. And so I think it's important for, for contractors to understand that because, uh, you know, the more thought that a contractor puts into a solution to an RFI, not just asking some open-ended question, but really thinking things through and trying to think from an architectural perspective allows the contractor to come up with a solution that when the architect sees that, they might have something to add or it kickstarts an idea, but you get a response much quicker and it's a much more collaborative process. So I think like what you said, just trying to understand where we're all coming from helps us to collaborate, to drive to solutions. You know, it doesn't have to be such an adversarial process, you know, us versus them. It could be, it could be collaboration. Well, and that's where it really does have to go both ways. If I, as an architect, understand a contractor's schedule and the impact that I'm really having by delaying my response, 
Yeah. You know, th that, that helps me to see uh, when I have to just go a little bit faster, when it, where I can allocate my resources, because that's really what it is. Um, I know you need an answer right away, but guess what? I got another fire and it's twice as big. Right. So yeah, it's, if I can understand what's the real impact and I don't understand that without knowing a thing or two about construction management. So it really does go, go both ways. They need to understand me and I need to understand them. Well, I think, I think the contractor could do a little bit more to help an architect understand the schedule because a lot of contractors don't even understand the schedule. You know, there are these massive, you know, sometimes 50 page reports. Um, <clears throat> so I, I think it's important for contractors to understand that not everybody speaks their language and there needs to be a little bit of an education. Um, I remember just just the real world scenario. We were working with a structural engineer and and the engineer that they had put on this project was was brand new to the industry. This was his first project ever, right? And I remember a conversation that our superintendent had with this structural engineer. Like, <clears throat> you know, we need this response. It's on the schedule. We sent the schedule to you. And he just had no idea he had never seen a schedule before. He didn't know what the, super, you know, it was a P6 schedule. So the superintendent was saying, I sent you the P6 schedule. And the engineer was like, well, what's a P6 schedule? I don't even know what that is. <laughs> so, you know, I, I think we could all do a little bit more to educate each other, you know, and, and it's really, it really should be independent of what the project delivery method is, you know, uh, you know, regardless of whether or not you're working on a design build or an integrated project delivery, you know, contract, you know, you should keep an open mind and, and try to think of ways to be collaborative with, with the other side, you know. And I think software is taking us in that direction. You know, I think there are a lot of new softwares now and I haven't used them, so I can't speak intelligently about this, but um, the things that I read tell me that there are softwares out there now that are giving updates as to how this does affect the schedule as an R RFI is issued. And I think that's important. You know, you can't expect me as the architect to understand the impact on the schedule that you sent me two months ago. Mm -hmm. It's that's gone. That, you know, I'm not looking at that on a daily basis anymore. I, I can't retain that kind of information. And so I almost need to know what's the current impact and uh, software can definitely make that a little bit easier for us. Yeah, I mean, you know, just just before our interview started, you know, you and I were talking about the uh, the BIM three hundred and sixty cloud cloud based collaboration, um, and you know, the the feeling that I get of a lot of these cloud based collaboration tools, not just from Autodesk but from others, is that they're really trying to break down the silos in the industry just by just by shaping the software to be automatically collaborative. Right, you don't have to do anything extra to collaborate; it's just there because, you know, as an architect. <clears throat> the contractor could go into your Revit model in the cloud and post an RFI in the model. And, and then automatically you have some, some visual spatial awareness of, of how important this RFI might be. You know, maybe, maybe the, you're looking at the 3D model and the RFI is right on top of the curtain wall system, right? And it's two weeks before the curtain wall is supposed to be installed. And so as an architect, you just automatically know that like, this is really important because you know, I know that they're doing this right now. Um, so I think the cloud-based, the cloud-based collaboration tools are really bringing people together in an automatic way, you know, without having to do anything extra. Well, even based on uh, what I see now from five years ago, five years ago, you would never have an architect sharing their model with the contractor. I mean, that almost did not exist. Right. And I know that even still, uh, when they do share, it's not exactly what the contractor is looking for. You know, right, they built right. it for their own purposes, but it's commonplace now. At yeah. least, at least the, the contractors that I talk to, I get a lot of reports that, oh yeah, we get our architect's model, we'll change it or rebuild it. But the sharing, the collaboration is, is becoming much more automatic. Yeah. And that's, that's a positive note. Well, even, you know, as a contractor, <clears throat> when an architect does share their Revit model, you know, I might, instead of looking at the sheets, I'll just look at the, at the model and kind of see what the, and, and I've uncovered a lot of behind the scenes information that way as a contractor that kind of helps me understand the project a little better just by looking at the model. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that that's, that's really nice. And yeah, like you said, I think, 
I think architects used to guard that a little bit more closely and now they're liability. It was all about liability. So yeah. I don't know how that's becoming, uh, you know, undone per se. It must have some, something to well, do with it. We, we usually, so as a contractor, before you can get the, the Revit model, you, you have to sign a BIM release agreement, mm -hmm. basically stating that the contract documents govern the project and the model shouldn't be used for, for anything related to construction whatsoever. So a lot of times, if, if we would see something in the model that filled a gap in the contract documents, we would still have to process an RFI clarifying, hey, you know, we noticed this in the Revit model, it's not necessarily in the contract documents, please please confirm. And so that would make it part of the, the contract. So yeah, you do, even though, even though the software is finding ways to break down the silos and allow for more collaboration, there's still that contractual gap that you have to fill just yep. to, to limit the liability. So yep. until, until they could figure out that, <laughs> um, you know, I don't think full collaboration is ever completely possible. No, and, and, and it sounds so easy when you say, you know, sign a form and now we've got it resolved. But as soon as somebody gets burned there, which they do, and yeah. then they don't want to go through that again. So, you know, there are reasons. It's not a perfect system yet. Yeah, not a perfect system, but hopefully some someday. Yeah. yeah. And it's going to take much more than software to, to break down the barriers. I think. Yep. Software is a good, the technology is a, is a great, is a step in the right direction. Yep. Yeah. Well, um, <clears throat> I don't have any more questions for you, Nate. Is there anything you'd like to say in closing? I just, I guess um, the technology and the reason why we've been so attached to it is, you know, the ability to solve problems ahead of time is, is really what it's about. And, and, uh, we'll find ways to make it better. We'll find ways to do more collaboration, but what we love in our program is just that. If we can help you learn how to solve problems and you don't have to wait until you get there, you know, we can figure it out beforehand. You're saving a lot of money. You're saving money for your, uh, as a contractor, you're saving money for the owner. We, we know that's why this is a game changer. And so it, that'll always be the essence of what we're trying to do. Let's, let's use the technology to our advantage. Thank you so much for watching our video today. If you'd like to receive more of this content, feel free to like and subscribe. Also, please feel free to leave a comment below. We'll try to answer any questions or comments in our next video interview. Thank you. Bye.